All right, so how's it going, everybody? I'm in Mexico. I'm in Tulum. I am uh, partaking in a. I'm partaking in a psychic car wash. I'm partaking in a cognitive slip and slide. I am diving with uh, body and with mind into the ocean to cleanse my spirit in search of renewal, in search of transformation and transcendence, endless waves of transformation. The source of anxiety most of the time is wanting to be in control, wanting to control oneself, wanting to control others, wanting to control one's entire universe. As human beings, we aspire to Godhead. As human beings, we aspire literally to be masters of our fate. But once in a while, we find that we have to surrender, we have to let go, we have to succumb, we have to submit. And this is a terrifying ordeal. Joseph Campbell calls it the supreme ordeal, the moment in which we must face potentially the dissolving of our very identity. And think about the ways that we keep it together. Think about the ways in which we affirm our identity. We do it through our work. We do it through our art. We do it through acts of heroism. We do it by bending the world to our will, by partaking in meaningful endeavors, by slaying the dragon. We affirm our identity. We get into romantic relationships where by falling head over heels and loving somebody else and in turn being loved by them, they cement our identity in the world. So what happens when we lose things? Think we, when we lose these things. What happens when we fail? What happens when we collapse? What happens when we experience heartache and breakups and failure and fear? <laughs> this is the supreme ordeal because it threatens the annihilation of our identity. It threatens an implosion of the self. And this is probably the most terrifying ordeal that human beings can ever deal with. In fact, the nerd writer made a fabulous, unbelievably brilliant video called Did Shakespeare Invent Love? where he talks about how, you know, a couple hundred years ago, we lived in a world where there was no ap upward mobility whatsoever. So you were kind of born into a particular lot in life, and your life was pretty much set. Things weren't going to change. And so even though if you were born at the bottom of the ladder, it was a pretty terrible situation, at the very least you had the security of knowing that your situation wasn't your fault. It was just ordained. It was just the way things were. Then, with the evolution of upward mobility, when society changed, when all of a sudden uh, the responsibility was on your shoulders to make something of yourself rather than just to come to the situation you had been born into, that was empowering if you were one of the winners. But if you experienced failure, if you didn't succeed, if you didn't become what you wanted to become, that failure, that responsibility then bore on your shoulders and sat that was the first time in history where we saw the incidents for the first time of illnesses of mental health like depression like anxiety like bipolar like schizophrenia and so the idea that these diseases these that mental illness itself is a social byproduct of a fractured broken system where we have no ways to deal with the pressures of whether we succeed in life and in love and in work and so we bear the brunt of these failings and so it just it's a lot of pressure for human beings and I think that that's why people lead lives of quiet desperation because if you don't make it you feel like you failed and it's a terrible thing um, a lot of the most popular TED talks of all time and intellectuals and speakers and motivational people out there talk about learning to fail and fail fast. Entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley tell us it's okay to fail. Just make sure you get up again. It's not how many times you get hit. It's how many times you get back up, so to speak. So anyway, um, here in Tulum and I'm thinking a lot about that. And I'm actually my buddy over here as a solopreneur and thinker and seeker, how do you deal with um, moments that threaten to dissolve your identity? <laughs> Moments that threaten to dissolve your identity. Yeah, I think it shatters everything. It, it, it literally is something that that challenges the the ego entirely. Yeah. Well, this is That's fun. The mic. I get to. This is the mic. Yeah. What you can do is simply. Let me put on this here, huh? Yeah. 
your entire workflow and day-to-day -day existence changes when something like that happens. It could be anything. It's not even something in your career or your business. It could be something in family. It could be something in your reality at all that challenges your your being and no longer affirms who you are. But right? Remember when we had that conversation? Remember when we had that conversation about uh, being afraid to stare yourself in the mirror? Mm -hmm. Like that human beings are not really ready to know themselves. Absolutely. They're not really. They're not really ready to to I'm putting the mic in the middle folks but anyway <laughs> that human beings are not really ready to face themselves nakedly like we have all these we have all these uh, these ways in which we again in which we affirm and anchor our identities and we anchor ourselves in the world through our relationships through our social status through the things we own through the things we purchase through how many followers on Instagram we have all these things when all these when when the rug is pulled from underneath our feet when there's actually a threat of annihilation of dissolution of identity that's when people fall into personal crises that's mm -hmm. when you fall into what Joseph Campbell calls the supreme ordeal and so it's just like what the hell do we do you know and that's the moment we're most afraid of actually looking back to the mirror which is where we began to decide who we wanted to become and that's we're true. afraid to look in the mirror because we're afraid of the challenge that we might have to work through. Yeah. It means that that piece of our life might have to actually change. There's possibly mm. a transformation that has to take place. Mm. And that transformation is almost always painful through that lens. And we talk about things like yeah. cognitive framing of yeah. looking at that supreme well, ordeal yeah. and changing the past or changing yeah. the current event to, yeah. to create a more beautiful meaning for yourself. That's well, that, the only way through. That, well, that's, that, that's very well put when you say the cognitive framing because even in the, the moment of ego identity dissolving, the most terrifying moment of all is when you stare into the void. Eric Davis calls it the moment when baseline reality dissolves and no new reality has yet emerged in its pixelating wake. It's like you fracture the bardos and you stare into the void. You stare into the, the nothing, right? It's, you actually see what it's like to not exist or to go mad or to implode. It's, it's who you are without your psychological anchor points. And it's harrowing. It's anguish. It is ultimately the supreme ordeal. But it is at these moments where certain tools, like the cognitive reframing, like I I employing language not just as a descriptive tool, but employing language as a generative tool comes into focus. You know, I was talking about the work of uh, Fernando Flores. So Fernando Flores was a Chilean politician who was arrested and he coined the term ontological design in a book called Computer Science and Cognition. And the key idea was that once you realize that language, that words are not just descriptive, but are actually generative, you can use language to serve your story, to serve the narrative, to serve the reality tunnel, the identity defining universe, symbolic reality in which you live. And so once you take control of that symbolic reality, then the moment in which your identity dissolves is a chance for renewal, for a transformation. Cognitive reframing turns the trauma into a springboard for a new and improved <laughs> version of yourself. What do you think? Sounds this good. All, right? This is all they mean when they say that things are meant to happen in life or that everything works in my yeah. favor. Right. Uh, that's, that's really all it is. It's the, but this is, the, this is the actual framework behind how to apply it. And it's a beautiful thing because totally. without those tools, we're looking into the void. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it's the scariest place we've ever been into our lives. And <laughs> all of our worst qualities come out. Totally. You know, in me, it's things like I just get irritable yeah. and I just get frustrated. Yeah. And maybe I take it out on the people around me that yeah. I most love. And that's the last thing that we want to do. Totally. We want to always be that best version of ourselves, not the one that's looking into the void. You can join us, by the way. This is Techi, everybody. Say hi. There's, there's a thousand people. Hi, thousand people. <laughs> Have a seat. Aquí nos acabamos de encontrar de una amiga. We're talking about how we construct identity in the face of moments of uh, potential transformation. You know, when, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, so to speak. It's, it's you know, and estamos hablando también of how words are not just descriptive, but words are generative. So the idea that las palabras no son solamente una descripción de la realidad, sino que las palabras eh, generan realidad. Y transmiten el alma. También. Exacto. But, but, so the idea is that we're empowered by using language to construct the reality that we want. And even in the face of hardship, we can spin the story in a way that serves us and that nourishes us. Actually, there's a very interesting book. I'm not really into like astrology in general, but I remember once I was recommended a book 
by somebody, and I forget their name, but it was called pronoia. Mm. And, okay, so we're all familiar with the term paranoia. And sometimes in the face of hardship, especially if you're anxious or depressed, you feel the sense that the world is conspiring against you, that everything is working out against your favor. But again, these are just words. This is just cognitive interpretation. And so the key idea of pronoia is that it's an antidote to paranoia, right? So pronoia, so paranoia says, oh, everything is against me. Pronoia says, actually, no, the universe is conspiring in my favor. So it's a shift in cognition, right? It's a cognitive reinterpretation of what's happening to us, and it allows you to then spin things in a way that serve you, which means that even difficult moments become opportunities for transformation. Even difficult moments become excuses for self-improvement. And it's a much better cognitive approach to mental health and dealing with hardship, don't you think? I think so. I think that words can be very powerful but thoughts are more powerful than words yeah but the problem is you can't always control your thoughts you can control your actions you know i mean i guess people who meditate can control their thoughts but i quickly we were talking about this before we have yeah. a mosquito. i have a mosquito thank you for saving me <laughs> you can you can control your actions so sometimes if your thoughts are not serving you it's like okay i'm going to shift my activity i'm going to do something different i'm going to put myself in a different situation i'm going to put myself in an embodied situation so a little bit of risk taking like bike riding or surfing or snorkeling deeply embodied situation that's going to force me into flow that's going to quiet the monkey mind and then when i'm going to come out of the experience replenished and refreshed then i'm going to be like okay the story now is going to be different because mm -hmm. you've you've cleansed and then it's like okay what's the new story what's the new cognitive interpretation how am i going to deal with heartache or failure or fear mm -hmm. as an opportunity to like be a, a warrior mm -hmm. of the psyche Brave. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? It's beautiful. It's uh, <laughs> it's like what we were talking about uh, yeah. two days ago with good words, right. good thoughts, good deeds. Oh, that's a brilliant one, dude. Reversing that paradigm, mm -hmm. um, which is an ancient 5,000-year-old saying. And here we are realizing that the shortcut to actually changing the situation could be to take action first, to go into that flow state first, that deeply immersive activity, then speak differently about what we just experienced and completely view it and think about it mm. in a completely different way.